let me start a bit uh, uh, with my background, um, just to have some context. So my name is Ankur Jain. I um, originally from Delhi, so grew up there. I went to IIT Delhi. I studied computer science. Then I came to the US uh, about over 20 years ago, uh, in late 90s. Came here for uh, graduate school. So I went to UCLA for a master's in computer science. Later went to Wharton for an MBA. And I was part of a couple of technology startups, one in late 90s, a company here in uh, Los Angeles, which was uh, building a product to make content faster on the internet. And this company was acquired for about half a billion dollars in 2000. But that was an interesting time. Uh, valuations were high. And when the bubble burst, it all came crashing down around us. So uh, got a quick learning about the business cycle uh, early in my career. After that, I was part of another startup in the networking space, and we did well. We were acquired by Cisco in 2004 for over a billion dollars. Then I was leading a group uh, in Cisco for a few years, then moved to venture capital about 10 years ago. I was part of a venture firm in San Francisco uh, called Blumberg Capital. It manages about $450 million investing across US and Israel. A great experience for me looking at how they're building global startups out of Israel. And then another venture firm called Nexus Venture Partners, which manages about one and a half billion dollars across US and India. At both the firms, I was fortunate to be part of a number of successful investments um, and learned a lot and uh, invested across US, India, and Israel. Then left that to do a startup of my own, which uh, did not succeed. So I had a number of tough lessons learned on that. Probably the hardest part of my professional career, but also the most compressed form of learning I've had. So uh, after that, I wanted to come back, I took that learning, but wanted to come back to venture capital, uh, but this time as an entrepreneur. So 2016 is when we started Emergent Ventures. Um, so we are a team uh, of four people, all of us based here in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. We have been investing and operating in software for over two decades and with a career track record of over 25% IRR. Um, and in fact, our most recent fund is tracking to 43% IRR as you speak. So it is uh, the software and software investing is an area which we are very familiar with and have uh, you know, been through ups and downs and different cycles. So let me talk about venture capital. Uh, I think different people have different familiarity with venture capital. So let me uh, uh, set some context there. So venture capital as an asset class uh, continues to generate very attractive returns over uh, since its history. It's a relatively new asset class uh, in the US. Uh, in its current form, it developed around the 1980s. And that's when uh, major endowment institutions started to look at it. Um, and over the years, now the popularity of the asset class has grown. It has gone into a number of other institutions, family offices, and now trick, you know, has trickled down to the high net worth individual uh, as well. These are the uh, uh, returns, uh, historical returns for venture capital as an asset class. These are the top two quartiles. The, in venture capital, uh, the uh, returns vary quite a bit. The top quartiles of uh, venture funds have very good returns. But if you are the bottom quartile, the last 25%, those returns are not great. So it's important to be in the top uh, one or two quartiles to generate the right kind of returns. So if you look at this, uh, you'll see, of course, you know that uh, the first graph is 20 year uh, time frame for rent, uh, returns. In this case, you see 76%, which is unusually high. And that is mostly driven by during 1980s, 1990s, uh, there was exceptionally high rate of return on venture capital because of uh, times of the you know, situation around that time. But even after that, even in the last two decades, it has returned over 20% as an asset class compounded, uh, which is, as you can see, compared to S&P, uh, this is, the, this is uh, we're primarily talking about, uh, you know, majority of this is US uh, venture capital. And uh, if you compare that to S&P and others, it is significantly outperformed uh, in a meaningful way. So uh, 
it has established itself as a very attractive uh, asset class for uh, compounding returns over long periods of time. And then as uh, I was saying, the portfolio allocations to venture capital have been growing. As the asset class has become more established, as people have gotten to uh, know more about that. So as you can see, the, the leading uh, institutions and family offices have been um, increasing allocations. The green line is the top death side. So these are among the institutions and endowments, the top 10 performers of returns, um, which drive that. They, these, that's the green line. And the uh, blue is the other, the other remaining 90%. So as you can see, the top performing institutions and endowments, they tend to have an overweighting of venture capital in the portfolio. Um, the, and a significantly higher weighting, which has been one of the key reasons for them to uh, drive out performance in their overall portfolios. And the general recommendation for uh, uh, family offices and high, uh, has been around 15 to 20% of the portfolio to venture capital uh, in the current time because of the uh, nature of the asset class. And that's what you can see the, on the average institutions are, the good institutions are turning to around 15% uh, allocation. The other thing in terms of venture capital is the nature of the asset class is such that the number of, comp number of startups that can be, let's say, a $100 million company there are a lot of those companies. How many can be a billion dollar company? There are money, much fewer. How many can be a $10 billion company? Even fewer and rare. So this is an asset class where it's hard. The job becomes much harder if you are working with large amounts of capital. So in this asset, because the number of companies that get to that kind of a scale as startups is very, very few. As you can see, there's only been one flip cart you know, in, in the last 15 years in India, in the, in the venture capital space. But there are lots of companies which have had successful you know, venture capital exits at a smaller scale. So in this asset class, the smaller venture funds have uh, strongly outperformed the larger venture funds because the number of uh, opportunities that smaller venture funds have are far more. And it takes a level of specialization to be able to, you know, e-commerce is different, enterprise software is different, India is different, US is different. So the good investors tend to be specialized and small were able to take their domain expertise, their network, uh, and use that to multiply capital in a significant way. So uh, the first uh, chart here is just uh, reiterating what I was saying earlier in the previous graph, that the top quartal uh, venture funds have actually performed, outperformed S&P by over 2x for the past three decades, so double the return of public stocks. And the smaller and the younger firms, uh, the smaller funds, they tend to drive 40 to 70% of venture returns because of the nature I mentioned, because the smaller funds and the smaller strategies tend to heavily outperform. And the smaller funds tend to drive 180%, 1.8x returns of the broader, larger venture funds. So in this asset class, small is certainly beautiful um, when it comes to venture capital. Uh, let me then talk about the current uh, environment. The current, uh, you know, because of COVID, what has happened uh, in, this, in this year, has actually affected different industry segments very differently. Uh, at Emergent, we classify different sectors into red, yellow, and green. And based on, uh, compared to other recessions, uh, this has been very different because of how it has affected different sectors very differently. So the red sectors were like travel and transportation, hospitality, oil and gas, commercial real estate, aerospace, which have been very badly affected. Uh, some of these companies are going bankrupt and uh, it's a very difficult situation for those industries. Some which are in the yellow bucket have been affected, uh, but still going okay, but definitely have seen impact. Financial services, logistics, media and advertising, professional services, and so on and so forth. But there's a third bucket, which is the green sector, which I've actually seen a huge acceleration because of this uh, downturn. These are companies in remote work collaboration. We're all using Zoom right now. <laughs> so as you can see, the Zoom market cap is literally you know, grown multifolds in the last few years. It's a huge multi-billion dollar company now. But broadly, the trend of remote work collaboration, uh, software as a service and cloud have taken off uh, and grown in a phenomenal way. Local delivery, e-commerce, uh, telemedicine, and so many of these sectors have really taken off 
uh, and uh, unprecedented demand spike is what we're seeing right now. Let me, out of this, let me double think to software. So the software industry has been around for about you know, 50 years now, uh, starting in 70s, and has gone through different evolutions. The very first uh, software uh, companies starting in 1970s, 80s, were taking best basic pen and paper processes and just automating that, uh, which was valuable, um, and created a number of you know, very successful, very large companies out of that. The Microsoft we know came, you know, started in late 70s, a trillion dollar company, and many others, you know, Oracle and so many IBM, uh, their products, product services division and Lotus and so many of those companies got started. And then about 20 years ago or so, we started seeing the uh, trend of what is called software as a service. Instead of you trying to install software on your laptops, you just go to the web browser, you start using software on the website, uh, much better usability, graphic, graphical interfaces. And again, that has produced over a hundred public companies, multi-billion dollar companies out of that. And the current evolution of software is what we call intelligent software. This is about using the power of data more intelligently. This is about taking technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, uh, data from lots of you know, devices which are all connected to the internet and taking all of that data and using the power of data to enhance how business is done across sales, marketing, finance, supply chain, customer service, HR. And all these functions are dramatically changing around us. And each of these waves has created trillions of dollars of new market wealth. And that is what is happening today. The wave of intelligent software is creating trillions of dollars of new market wealth, which is, presents an amazing opportunity for venture capital to be able to work and invest in these startups to capture part of that value. And in today's world, uh, every new business is essentially being powered by intelligent software in some way or shape or form. You know, is Amazon a retail company or a technology company? You know, is Tesla an automotive company or a technology company? All these companies are using in some shape and form components of intelligent software in their stack. And that uh, the adoption of that and the scale of that is only growing uh, every day as we speak. Now, let me talk about another uh, uh, aspect of uh, evolution in, in how this, uh, these startups are functioning. There is uh, now a big um, uh, inflection point for what I would call cross geography startups, which are leveraging more than one geography to build companies. So I live in Silicon Valley. I've been living here for 20 years and it has phenomenal advantages of being here in Silicon Valley. You know, there is um, great capital available here there is go to market uh, talent. They know how to scale companies. How do you take a company from a million to hundred million to a billion dollars? They have that expertise, the talent is there. Acquirers, all the large acquirers are here. Um, but at the same time, if you're looking to build a team of 50, 100, 200 engineers, incredibly expensive. The, the cost of building a team in Silicon Valley has gone exponentially. Um, at the same time, a lot of great talent is now available in other parts of the world such as India. And the Indian tech talent started about 15, 20 years ago. Of course, the big companies, the Cisco's and the Microsoft's and the Oracle set up their offshore development centers. Um, and over time, uh, those uh, have created a great pool of talent and at all levels over 15, 20 years and created the seeds of the newer generation of entrepreneurs who have learned and uh, how to build global products out of India. But the older generation was happy working with large companies and you know, being employed of those companies, but the newer generation, they're younger, they're more hungry, they've had more global exposure and they want to start companies. And they've also got more savvy on the business side of how do you build product, how do you sell products? So we're seeing uh, in some ways the best of both worlds coming together where you can potentially combine both of these capabilities. You can take the best of Silicon Valley um, and then combine with a technology team in India, um, which uh, really allows you to build a much more capital efficient product. And also for the same dollar, you can build a much bigger, much more capabilities in your product and also provide a much deeper level of customer service to your clients. So in some ways you get the best of both worlds. Now it's not easy. Uh, you have to work across time zones. 
uh, you have to have an extra level of transparency co communication in your companies to make these models work. But if you can make it work, the rewards are phenomenal. Now, interestingly, uh, so that's majority of what we do is in this, uh, we're using this strategy. And uh, we are able to tap into this in a unique way. And there is a, almost like a secret in plain sight that many people don't know. If you look at the enterprise software, when I say B, enterprise B2B software uh, in, in the US, uh, but companies like that, US companies leveraging India as a tech hub, that is an emerging, a very high growth category. Do uh, you see these logos? Now many of you, these are not household names because these are B2B software companies, so many of you may not have heard of it. But all these are billion dollar, multi-billion dollar companies. On the left side, these are all companies that have had recent exits. AppDynamics was acquired for $4 billion by Cisco, Nutanix went public, now it's a $6 billion market cap. Zscaler is now a $20 billion company uh, on NASDAQ. By the way, uh, all these companies that I mentioned here, the product is being built out of India. Uh, most of the world doesn't even know that. Zscaler looks like a, any other company. They think of all these companies, if you go to their website, the headquarters looks has a Silicon Valley address. The CEO sits in the Silicon Valley. The sales and marketing is there. But if you open the hood, it's like open the car. The bulk of the team is in India, building all these products. Zscaler, for example, the entire engineering team is built out of Chandigarh, right? For example, Aptus, including had a team in Ahmedabad of, of all places. Uh, and so many of these companies. Uh, Zoho is now a three and a half billion dollar company, team out of Chennai. So uh, what we're seeing is we did an analysis of there are about 77 enterprise unicorns in the US. One is unicorn a company with over a billion dollars in market value. Interestingly, over 20% uh, of them uh, actually already follow this model. Uh, it's almost like uh, you know a category hidden in plain sight. Um, and interestingly, this category has grown about 10x in the last five years. This was not 10 years ago, this is not the case. But in the last few years, the number of companies following this model as a maturity of the Indian tech ecosystem has, has happened, it's just grown exponentially. At every level of the company, these are companies I'm showing which are billion dollar plus. Um, if I go at the earlier stage, there are over 300 startups in India right now doing over 1 million, one million, one, over 1 million revenue with the primary market is outside India. In the next five or seven years, one number of, number of these companies will turn out, grow to this you know, multi hundred billion dollar valuations. So we're seeing that evolution, like a, you, know, you have a class of kindergarten and fifth grade and 12th grade, we're seeing the classes of these startups at all stages and, um, and, and uh, phenomenal uh, growth. Uh, now, the, for this particular ecosystem, we have established Emergent as the leading seed venture fund for this ecosystem. And, and we've established that because we've built very unique expertise in both India and US uh, geographies to be able to help these companies, source these companies, and, and you know, uh, grow and exit those companies. So that is very uh, interesting and a growth area. And as you know, uh, the tech ecosystem and the talent in India is not going anywhere. So in the next uh, couple of decades, this uh, trend, in my opinion, is only gonna uh, grow many times from here. In many ways, India is doing uh, what Israel did. Uh, what Israel did to cybersecurity, India is doing to uh, uh, enterprise software. Let me walk through a couple of case studies. It'll, be, it'll, uh, it'll better illustrate uh, the point uh, you know, of how this model is working. Uh, there is a company called Mingja. Uh, the founder uh, uh, went to IIT Delhi, used to work for Amazon, the cloud business in Bangalore, and left there uh, to start Mingja about a few years ago, which was a software as a service product, helping other enterprises manage their uh, cloud infrastructure. The company got started in Bangalore. They got customers in India like Hindustan Lever, Tata Motors, but the company wanted to come to the US market. And um, we know the founder um, and uh, they came to us. We were the only, we were the only uh, seed fund in the US helping companies like this coming to the US market. We saw the potential of the team and the company and we led the investment in this company and helped them come to the US market. Their very first customer in Silicon Valley, we had to put our credibility on the line to get them that first customer account uh, in the US. We used to go to trade shows with them, stand on their booth, 
listening to what customers are saying and helping them refine the messaging for the US market. It took us a few months, but we started to get that messaging right. The company started to grow. And then there's a public company called Nutanix. Uh, you might uh, have noticed the Nutanix logo appeared on one of the previous slides, which I showed successful um, you know, companies, uh, billion dollar companies, which have India tech team. So Nutanix was a very natural synergy with Nutanix. We know the CEO of Nutanix well. We made the introduction, we helped both parties uh, agree on a partnership uh, model and Nutanix wanted to acquire Minjar. We uh, actually became the stockholders agent to facilitate that transaction. And Nutanix acquired Minjar about two years ago. We got 85% IRR on that investment, which we distributed back to our investors. But that again shows you how these kinds of companies are able to you know, grow, get initial customers and also exit successfully in this model. I'll give another example. There's a company called Observe.ai. Um, uh, what they're doing is it's an AI-based solution for call centers. So today, whenever you make a call to any kind of call center, I'm sure you get this message. Your call may be recorded for quality purposes. Uh, so there's actually a quality assurance team setting these call centers. They manually sample about 2% of the calls. They listen to them and then they fill out a report of what happened for quality assurance, uh, quality assurance and compliance purposes. But the problem is they're missing out on 98% of the calls. So if you had a bad experience, most likely they will never find out about it. And also the quality of the work that they're doing is very average because they're not the most highly paid or motivated people to do this job. So Observe uses AI to automate this quality assurance and compliance, which is a very large market. Uh, globally, about uh, $300 billion is spent on call centers. Out of that, $10 billion is spent on quality assurance alone. So for that category, they've emerged as a leading solution um, in the market. This company, the founder, uh, also went to IIT Delhi, used to work for Twitter in San Francisco. He moved back to Bangalore to start the Twitter India office in Bangalore. He left Twitter, started this company, um, and we became the very first investor in the company. And we helped define the idea. The idea was somewhat raw at that stage. We helped shape the idea into, into the current form. We used to go to customer meetings together in the early days. We also helped them onboard the third co-founder who's heading sales for the company right now. And they've been on a phenomenal trajectory. They've been growing 4X year over year. Now 150 plus enterprise customers across US, Europe, and Asia. Uh, the founder moved back to Silicon Valley after that, after the, our funding. The, there's a team headquartered in San Francisco. The CEO sits in San Francisco, sales and marketing is here but all the engineering and AI team is in Bangalore. And I'll tell you the funny thing, uh, this year, Forbes nominated them among the top 50 AI companies in America. Gartner nominated them among the top 25 enterprise software companies in America. So the rest of the world, they are a US company like any other US company. But again, if you open the hood, out of 125 people, 100 people are in Bangalore, only 25 are in the US. Uh, they've now raised $85 million from top tier investors. And we're about 27X on our initial investment just in three years on this company. And the way the size of the market opportunity for this company is such that this company can potentially be, you know, potential is to be a multi-billion dollar public company one day. Um, but hopefully again, that gives you a flavor of how much um, uh, good work is being done in this India-US corridor. And these companies are actually US, they're all such as US corporations. Their market is US, their revenue is US, the headquarters is US and their fund future fundraising and exit is also US. So unlike India, which the India, the exit market the M is much, uh, much more nascent. So in India, there are not as many companies which have gone public or have been acquired because the market's still evolving. But the US market is very mature for exits, merger and acquisition for IPOs. So the liquidity profile is very different. The uh, number of companies uh, that actually get acquired is uh, significant. Even for uh, companies which don't have a lot of success, even for team and technology, there are a lot of acquisitions. That really provides a very healthy uh, ecosystem for driving venture returns. You know, for people who have, again, uh, people are different levels of familiarity with how venture capital fund works. Just to uh, provide some context for people who are not familiar, uh, this is an illustrative example of how a VC fund works. Typically, life of the fund tends to be a certain number of years, let's say eight years, 10 years. 
And then people commit to a certain amount. Let's say in this example, somebody would have committed let's say $250,000. The Amani is drawn over a period of few years. Um, and because the companies are you know, growing. So in this example, the money was drawn over five years. Uh, and then as and when those companies are exiting, then the uh, money is returned back to investors. For example, some companies may exit in year six, some year seven, year eight. So at this time, the money is being distributed back to investors. And then the IR is calculated based on the timing of uh, when the money was sent and money was returned. So in this example, specific example, so let's say somebody invests 250K, they received a million dollars back through these uh, cash flows, which amounted to about 26% IRR in this example. Again, this is obviously every venture fund will have a different profile of returns, but this is just to provide an example of how venture capital fund works in principle. Uh, I would also mention that well, people also perceive the venture capital uh, to be a uh, you know, risky asset class, but um, especially in the US, it is actually a very uh, good way of managing risk. The first of all, it's a very natural dollar cost averaging because you're investing money over a period of time. So it, across market cycles, you're averaging your uh, cost very naturally. Also, even the, uh, I talked about the top uh, two quartiles, which are which drive a lot of the performance, but even the low quartile, even they can eke out, you know, uh, a reasonably sort of, you know, positive return or at least a break even return. So it's, um, it's not that, it's not, people would still end up making money potentially, even on the lower performers. And the other very important thing is, it uh, tends to have a low or sometimes negative correlation with the stock and bond markets. So it's a very good diversifier in the portfolio uh, with other asset classes. And number of tax advantages. Uh, if you are a US investor, uh, some gains may be completely exempt from capital gains uh, because of you know, companies which are held for a period of time. And, uh, and also most of the gains are long-term capital gains. So, um, and for Indian investors, uh, it provides uh, you know, a few different aspects. One is uh, there's a unique, most for Indian investors, most of their assets are tied up in India. So this is a unique opportunity to participate in global innovation you know, beyond India. Uh, we often joke India US corridor is, uh, and the kind of these companies uh, are uh, investing in the success of Indians outside India and, and participating in that returns. Also, these are uh, US dollar vehicles. The companies are US dollar uh, companies because they're US incorporated and funds like our fund is also US dollar fund. So that also provides additional diversification in the portfolio. Traditionally, historically, US dollar has appreciated against the rupee almost about average 3% a year. So that uh, additionally drives additional return on top of the underlying you know, uh, fund returns. And then Indians can invest via LRS into these kinds of uh, you know, uh, companies or funds. And because uh, most of the gains are uh, long-term capital gains, it creates a fairly tax efficient structure uh, from a gains perspective. Uh, you know, hopefully that, uh, you know, I gave a lot of information, but hopefully gave, gave you some context about uh, you know, what's happening in this ecosystem, the opportunities, and how these markets function. So I'm happy to uh, you know, take questions uh, that people may have. Is there a way uh, the wealth advisors or independent financial advisors can collaborate with you, Ankur? Yes, absolutely. So we are working, in fact, uh, we have partnered with Finolutions, uh, which has been our uh, outreach advisor for India. And uh, through that, we are certainly working with a number of wealth advisors in India. So we're very happy to uh, collaborate with them. and. Uh, you know, we understand the needs of Indian investors. You know, uh, they have to obviously send money through LRS. And so we have that support of how they uh, send money outside India, how they handle in their tax returns in India. Uh, we've got the right size service providers who can advise them and handhold them to different steps in the process. Okay. And we also have a model of engaging with the IFA so that, you know, it's, it, uh, it's meaningful for them to engage with us. We also have a model for that. Sure. So I think Apoorva is going to speak uh, towards the later part of the day. So people who have questions about Finolutions, I think, can put up to him. Uh, so any, I mean, a question from my side, Ankur. Uh, uh, I mean, of course, uh, you're sitting in the heart of technological innovations. Uh, we, of course, try to follow all that. But where do you see, uh, what do you see as the next next big things coming up in terms of I, are you also dealing in fintech uh, related companies? Yes, yeah, so primarily our companies are uh, leveraging you know, intelligent software, 
but mm-hmm. and but some of these are catering to financial services. So yes, we have a company, for example, in the insurance space. We mm-hmm. are a company which is in what's called uh, asset-based lending. So yeah, so we have uh, again as long as the underlying models are uh, software-driven, uh, mm-hmm. we are uh, having companies across you know all these areas. So it's a fairly diversified uh, uh, kinds of companies. And you know, somebody was selling for enterprise marketing for insurance, somebody for asset lending, something for customer service. So it's a fairly uh, broad portfolio. So you see any trends or any uh, uh, products uh, that are coming up, which are uh, which have a potential of changing the way uh, business is done. So my questions are all uh, in context of financial services. Uh, yeah. Even if you were to talk about investments, uh, you know, any any interesting trends you are seeing or you know, that might potentially change the way the world of technology is operating right now? Yeah, so I would say the underlying what I was trying to uh, share in the presentation is really about company leveraging data more intelligently. That is uh, happening in every sector. Uh, you know, people may use the word AI, uh, but fundamentally about how to use data uh, more intelligently across. Uh, we're seeing, for example, in the case of financial services, we've been seeing startups which are looking to automate a lot of the reconciliation, right, in your accounting, in your transaction that you do. Today, you may have a lot of accountants you know, work, working through those uh, reconciliations and um, we are seeing company which are using AI to bring a lot of automation to that. So what, so 25% of your accounting, uh, you know, which used to do accounting may not even be needed because the AI can do all of that. So we are seeing a lot of solutions of these kinds in all sectors. Sure. There's a question from Subhashini here. Uh, what has been your ROI on uh, in the in venture capital post COVID? Yeah, so the uh, COVID hike's been for our kind of work has been, uh, you know, during March and April, we were concerned how things will pan out, but has been phenomenal. Uh, they are ex- the trend for adoption of technology has only accelerated post uh, during the because of COVID. So, in fact, all these companies that I uh, some of the portfolio, the Q2, Q3 were the best quarters ever. Um, a number of these companies have raised very good follow-on financings, are growing very well. So, the adoption of what COVID has really I would say, accelerated what would have happened in five years has happened in six months, uh, you know, in terms of the awareness, the urgency for uh, companies to adopt software-based technology. So, uh, so it's actually uh, created a very good ground for uh, you know, venture capital returns in these sectors. Sure. Uh, there's a question from Ashok. Uh, what kind of post expense and tax returns can a typical Indian investor expect for say three to five years? Uh, I'm assuming is talking in context of your fund mm-hmm. or similar funds. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I, uh, so post expense, I'm not exactly sure the term, but if, uh, just to uh, guess what I, my guess what you're trying to ask is, from a return perspective, we seek to deliver, you know, uh, 25% or higher uh, net IRR back to our investors. Uh, you know, excluding you remove all the expenses tax, all of those things, and net back to investors is what we uh, seek to target. We have two vehicles, an early stage vehicle, seed vehicle, uh, 25%. There's a later stage vehicle, which is 20%. That's what we seek to deliver. Uh, compounded to investors. And uh, most of these, I mean, pretty much almost all of the income uh, qualifies as long-term capital gains for investors in India, which mm. is taxed as, uh, you know, with 20% with indexation is what they uh, pay in India for that. Okay. And no other tax implications for Indian investors, right? Uh, or Correct. Any other? Yeah. yeah. U- U.S. does not withhold capital gains taxes for non-residents. So mm-hmm. the, because of that, there's no uh, on these typically there are no cap no taxes withheld in the U.S. All the taxes mm-hmm. only paid in India on long-term uh, basis, long-term capital. Uh, any compliance headaches or uh, any other issues that an Indian investor should be aware of when, when he's investing in a fund like yours? So there's no com- there's no special compliance uh, or anything like that. But yeah, they need to work with the right accountant to make sure that you know they are filing their in the taxes they are. Uh, you know, showing these things properly, what they mm-hmm. do. But again, uh, not all accountants have that experience, but we know a number of uh, accounting firms in India who have that experience mm-hmm. and who can advise these clients how to, you know, have, try, file their taxes properly. But yeah, uh, there are no other compliance. Uh, there are up to $250,000 per person per year can be sent outside India under the RRS scheme. Very. So that is pretty straightforward and uh, you know, there's no other compliance that we are aware of for that. Yeah. So Ashutosh has put up a question, but I'm not exactly sure. Uh, so I'll just read out. Anyways, Ashutosh, if you can reframe it. Uh, uh, he's asking what type of problem we face when we start a startup based in venture capital. So 
Uh, I'm not sure if he's talking to a venture capital startup or a startup which is taking money from venture capital. But let me assume. I mean, till he till he reframes this question. Uh, so, from an entrepreneur point of view, uh, who's who's raising money from you, uh, mm. are there any do's and don'ts? I mean, someone who's trying to raise money from you, are, would there are there any tips you'd like to give him? Yeah. So fundamentally, uh, as an investor, we're looking for a few things. We're an early stage investor. A, yeah. we're looking for large markets, uh, you know, which can cr- produce large scale companies because that's how the venture model works. You have to you know, create meaningful size companies, um, and these have to be best in. Oftentimes, being good enough in India is not good enough because we are looking at companies which can be globally competitive and win in the U.S. market. The company we're looking for is which are can compete with the other, uh, you know, best in class companies globally. So a lot of companies, let's say we may be building product in India, uh, fall through that filter. So in a given year, we probably see six to eight hundred companies invest in five to seven companies a year. So from six hundred, six hundred to eight hundred to five to seven, really ninety nine percent drop off. So mm. because there's a very strong filtering we have to do in terms of large markets, a product which can really compete at the global scale, and the mm. quality of founders who have that leadership ability to build a large company, right? Um, mm. What it takes is a, it takes a certain level of leadership in terms of what we look for, self-awareness in high quality entrepreneurs, ability to, the intensity to go the long distance uh, and have a balance to be able to manage organizations. We're looking for that kind of uh, people. So those are typically what uh, challenges I would say the com- our startups face, being able to get these things right. And that's what sure. we filter for. At our- uh, Ankur, I have a question. Uh, if uh, any any uh, you know cases you'd like to uh, share with us where you invested in an, uh, some idea and you found it to be too way ahead of time, and it did not really yield the result that you were expecting it to. Yeah, so I'll give an example. Uh, one company, in fact, right now in our portfolio, uh, this this person uh, founder went to IIT Kharagpur, uh, did his PhD from uh, Georgia Tech, and his PhD was using AI for data center management. And uh, you know, got some uh, his PhD thesis was in the area. Also, got some grants from National uh, you know, uh, Science Foundation in the US. Started mm-hmm. the company, uh, filed some papers. This was around how do you in data centers, how do you bring automation in using the, in the thermal management using mm-hmm. the AI. Mm-hmm. And we thought was a, a the founder had good uh, you know expertise in the AI area. We thought the thesis was interesting. He put in a small investment in the company. Uh, about, uh, but we found again that. The adoption in the market was uh, much lower than what we had envisioned. Uh, mm-hmm. Primarily because the number of companies that run these large data centers is very concentrated. There are mm-hmm. not that many. There may be they are very large companies, but they are not that many. And just being able to um, sell through that big department, there are also multiple departments involved. There's a facilities department, IT department. Getting all of them to put together the sales was turning out to be incredibly hard. So I would say I think this. Problem will be solved using AI, but made probably a few years later. This company was, uh, you know, was a little too early for that. But then we we felt the team and the idea has or the technology has potential. So mm-hmm. in the last few months we pivoted that to a different use case. Now it's about uh, application performance, which is a slightly different problem. But the same technology and the same team is. Uh, we took them to a few customers in that space, and that is working out well. So now they're working with a few customers on that problem, and that we're seeing uh, you know good uh, good results here. But yeah, that happens uh, sometimes that uh, companies are often too early. But if you invest in the right people and the right technologies, oftentimes we're able to learn from the market and adapt it to something which is more relevant today. Sure. So audience, uh, quickly, we have a few minutes to go. If you have questions, please post. Uh, one more question from my side, Ankur. Uh, other than US, of course, uh, which are the other uh, key regions which where you're seeing a lot of technological innovation happening or a lot of interesting startups? Tech- Technology-based startups coming up. So, from a, so there, I would say there are two kinds of flavor, right? There are companies which are uh, more consumer-centric, uh, whether it's e-commerce. Obviously, all India, China, every you know, all these companies are seeing a lot of growth. Um, uh, every, but the company which are building global software products, primarily, I would say, the three biggest uh, outside of US, the biggest hubs have been traditionally Israel. Um, and to some extent Europe. But now I would say India is uh, as a 20%, which is actually more than Israel now, uh, or, or or comparable to Israel. So I would say uh, outside of India and US, it would be Israel and to some extent Europe, which is producing this global technology kind of B2B companies. 
And those are the markets of VC deal flow uh, from those markets. Sure. So I don't see much for questions. I think uh, we'll uh, wind up the session here. Ankur, thank you so much for joining in. Uh, we look forward to keep engaging with you more on similar knowledge initiators in the future. And uh, uh, I hope things are, I mean, I know the elections are something which are beyond our control, but then how, how is the ground situation as far as COVID is concerned? Uh, things are fine. You know, we're, uh, we've been, you know, we are very uh, collaboration and remote work friendly. So our business has been going on, you know, without fail, uh, everything is well from my perspective. Talking about elections, I saw a joke. Uh, they said, you know, it takes, uh, the, the amount of time it takes to count votes in uh, in US, in that time in India, Sarkar ban bhi jati hai, gir bhi jati hai. <laughs> so true, so true. <laughs> no, yeah, so, we've been, all of us have been wondering here, of course, uh, nothing much changes, but uh, nevertheless, the, the spectacle that is US elections, I think last few days now, the counting yeah. has been on and on and on, and still you have no sh clarity. Yeah. Correct, correct. So are you, are you expecting things to change uh, if there's a new government in place? Uh, if, Not I'm talking really, because uh, the, uh, the Senate is Republican and the House is Democrat. So uh, in fact, to me, one of the reasons market has gone up is because of that. That means things will not change much because both parties are opposing. So they will not, nothing will get passed, which means things status quo will stay and so markets are happy with that. <laughs>